Hey there everybody, it's Mike Delisio. Today I'm going to be taking a look at Legacy of You, which is a solo-only campaign-style game coming from designer Shem Phillips and publisher Garfield Games. In Legacy of You, you are trying to build sections of a canal while having to deal with uncoming waves of barbarians who are trying to thwart your uh, progression. And this is done essentially through some card play and resource management. Why don't we head over to the table, I'll give you an idea on how the game is played. It will be spoiler free, by the way, because there are certain elements that would be spoiler, but I will keep it spoiler free. And then we'll come back here and I'll let you know what I think. Okay, here we see a game of Legacy of You all set up, as it would be at the beginning of a campaign, without giving away any spoilers. There might be some adjustments to the starting setup as you progress throughout the campaign. All right, so there is one way to win this game, and that is to build every section of the canal, which are represented by these six cards here, um, and make it to the end of that round that you've built that last canal without facing any of the three losing conditions. The losing conditions are, if you ever get seven barbarians up in this row at the beginning of the game, you only start with one barbarian in the row, but they're going to be added at the end of every round and progressively more and more will be added as you build more of the canal. Uh, so that is one loss condition. Another loss condition would be is if the flood marker ever goes onto an unbuilt canal card, that would trigger an immediate loss. And if you ever needed to draw one of these townsfolk cards, but did not have any to draw, that would be the third loss condition. So, three ways to lose the game, one way to win. You start the game with ten random townsfolk cards in your ready pile, and the rest of the deck is up here, and you've got a number of them on display. This is the rule book, but you can also keep it off to the side of the board here to give you a nice little round structure and an iconography guide as well. This is the storybook, which I will not be opening in this uh, overview, but whenever you have a icon such as this, where it's a number inside of a golden turtle, that would be when you would reference that book and you would go to that area of the storybook and it's going to progress the game along in some way, potentially add things, some, uh, something's going to happen. I will leave it at that. Okay, so let's go through this round structure briefly. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to harvest. And that is going to be represented by this symbol here. So it's going to tell you the number uh, or the items that you are going to harvest. Right now, this is nothing because it's covered up by these buildings, but as you remove these buildings and build them, these are other things that are going to be added to your harvest. So right now, at the beginning of the game, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get four cards from the top of your ready pile. And so you can just kind of put these along here for the time being. You're going to get one white worker, which is a laborer. You're going to get one cowrie shell. You're going to get one provision. Okay? As you build these buildings, for each one you build, you're going to be getting more cowrie shells during your harvest. Okay? So the harvest is basically, you'll always get these things, and then as you progress throughout the game, there are some other items you can add to your harvest to make that a more beneficial uh, portion. Then you're going to be taking actions, which is the meat of the game. So there are a number of different actions you can take. First of all, you can recruit some townsfolk. This first one is always going to be free. So if you wanted to take this townsfolk, you can go ahead and take it and you put it into your exhausted area, okay? You could also take either of those two because you do have a provision that you start the game with. So perhaps you'd want to spend a provision, take one of these two because the cost is right there, and you would also add that to your ex exhaust pile as well. Another thing you can do is you can discard them. So instead of getting them and placing them in your exhausted pile, you can spend whatever the cost is, and then you would get what it, whatever is in the upper tan portion there, and then you would just remove it from the game. It would be put into the discard pile, all right? Not into your exhausted pile, into the discard pile. So that's kind of how you can manipulate the townsfolk row there is by either bringing them into your exhaust pile or 
dismissing them for whatever the top goods are, okay? Another thing you can do is you can, you have to actually play all of the cards that you've drawn from your ready pile, okay? And so when you look at these cards, there's a number of different things that you can do. First of all, you're gonna disregard these food icons at the beginning of the game. As the game progresses, you'll learn what they might be used for. So one thing you can do is you can always take a card that's in, that's, uh, that has been drawn, and you can place it into your exhaust pile for the topmost resource. So in this case, if I wanted to get a Spearman, which is a blue worker, I can just go ahead and take that, put it into my exhaust pile, and now from the supply, I've got a Spearman in my ready area that I could utilize right away. Another thing you can do is instead of putting it into your exhausted pile, you can dismiss it, remove it from, uh, from the game essentially to get both of these items. So I can get a clay and a white worker by discarding that. I'd get a clay and a white worker, and now I've got that ready for me. So those are essentially what you can do. Uh, two of the things you can do. Another thing that you can do is you can utilize this bottom portion, which would be adding to your harvest, by tucking it under this spot. At the beginning of the game, you have only one spot available to tuck, and once it goes there, it's gonna stay there. And now what this says is that in future harvests, in addition to these items, I'm also gonna get a Spearman. So that's every round of the game, all right? Um, I have one card left to play. Perhaps I would just uh, put this into my exhaust pile to get a uh, provision and a cowrie shell. So I'll go ahead and do that. And now I've got a number of different things that I could do. I could just end the round right here if I wanted to, but I also have a whole bunch of resources to use. So perhaps I'd want to go ahead and use some of those resources. Um, one of the things I can do is I can place onto an open hut space. Right now there is only one available hut space, but as you build out these cards, more of them are going to appear. Now you would have a hut space that you can go to to get a worker of any color except for white. But right now at the beginning of the game, you can place any color worker here to get a provision. So let's say I did that, I put a spearman there, and now I've got a third provision. All right. Um, one of the things that I could also potentially do is build these buildings, all right? Uh, so to build one of these, it shows that I have to have a laborer, a clay, and a wood to be able to build one of those. And I can build these in any order, and what these would do is would be uh, allow me to get something else on the harvest, either a laborer or a provision or a worker of any color except for white. To be able to build any of these three types of buildings, you have to have a spot to place it. At the beginning of the game, you have only one spot to place it, which is right here. Um, and so you can't take an action to build a building unless you've got a spot. Where are you gonna get more spots? You're gonna get those by building out canal sections, which uh, right here underneath the card, it shows you what's underneath it. Um, so I could right now build one building if I had all of the uh, different uh, resources that I needed, but right now I actually don't. I have no wood and I need wood to build anything. There are also some trade uh, spots that you can use at any point uh, on your turn in any, uh, any number of times. If I had three cowrie shell shells, I can trade those in for a clay or a wood at the beginning of the game. As you build more sections of the canal, you are then going to get more um, potential trades that you can do. So one of the things I could do right now is build a section of the canal. It needs two laborers and two cowrie shells. I have that right now. So one of the things, actually, you know what I'm gonna do, just for the purposes of this, because I don't wanna spoil anything, let's say these came out in this order instead, so I can just show you what happens without having to skip what would happen there. So I go ahead and I spend those resources, my two laborers and my two cowrie shells. And now what happens is I will take this barge and place it here on the rule book because you can only do that once per round. Then what's gonna happen is I will get everything that's at the bottom. So I'm gonna get a clay, a wood, and what this symbol means is that I have to take a damage or destroy. I take the top card of my ready pile and it has to go to the discard pile. So that's not a good thing, but it is uh, something that is part of this particular canal. That one was showing you that to read section 42, which again, I don't wanna show you. So now that I've removed that, 
Now I've got a different trade I can make, which is two cowrie shells for a provision. I can do that as many times as I want. And I also have a second build spot here. So now I have two places and you'll see that they show different items. If I were to take this one, I could place it here to get a provision right away or there to get a cowrie shell right away. You just get it that first time that you place on that spot, okay? So these are the types of actions that you can be taking. You have to play all of the cards that you have out of your uh, ready pile that gets drawn at the beginning of the game. Uh, you can choose to spend resources to uh, play out. The, the, you don't have to, you can keep your workers throughout. You don't have to use them in a round. The only thing that is mandatory is you have to play out every card that you draw. Another thing I want to mention is here you've got these barbarians and you can attack these barbarians. To do so, you have to pay the number of uh, provisions underneath them. So in this case, I'd have to spend three, re three provisions, and then you have to spend what's up here. So I'd have to spend two spearmen and one yellow worker, which is an archer. Now, I clearly don't have that, but if I did, what I would do is pay those things, and I would get this as a reward, a cowrie shell, and I would draw a card from the top of my ready pile. All right, so at this point, I can't do that because I don't have the resources. So let's say that I've decided to stop. I've taken all my actions. Um, now I have to suffer attacks, okay? And so I have to look at the barbarians. At this point, there's only one. We're looking at the bottom part of the card here. And what this is saying is that I have to either destroy the top card of my ready pile or bribe them with some wood to not face that. So let's say that in this case, I decided, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and spend that wood I do that and I don't have to worry about the other uh, effect, which is to, de to destroy a card. All right, I've done that. Now the last thing is refresh the card row. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look and see how many barbarian cards are added, which is listed right up here. We'd be adding one. As you build more of these, you can see you'd be adding another one here, you'd be adding another one here, and another one here. So towards the end of the game, you're adding four barbarians to the card row. And remember, one of the loss conditions is having a full row there of barbarians. So in this case, what I would do is I would uh, refresh the card row just for the purposes of showing you kind of how more dynamic refreshing the card row can be. Let's say that I got a couple more of these workers that I wanted to go ahead and put into my exhausted pile. Let's say that I spent these two provisions. I took both of these and put them into my exhausted pile. Now uh, you'll get a better idea of how to kind of refresh the card row. So all of these will get slided to the left, all of the townsfolk cards that is, all right? You look at how many of the uh, barbarian cards are going to be added, which is one. You'll slide this to the left. You'll add one to the right. And again, as things go on, you'll be adding more. And now you fill the gaps with the remaining townsfolk cards. So you've done that. Um, and then you'd go through the, the harvest, uh, the harvest again. And again, now you'd have, uh, more that would be added to the harvest with this blue worker. You'd get more as you build these buildings as well. All right. As you go through, you're either gonna go uh, until you meet one of the win or loss conditions. And at that point, what you're gonna do is there are two decks here. This would be a victory, the victory deck. And so if you won the game, you would flip over this top card, do what it says. If you lose, you would go to this deck, flip over the top card, do what it says. You're gonna to continue to do that, going through back and forth, winning or losing games. Whether you win or lose the game, you progress right on until you eventually reach one of the gold cards, which is at the bottom of both of the victory and defeat decks. And so there'll be a variable number of games that you'll play in the campaign, depending upon how many games you win or lose but you'll continue to do that until you get to that gold uh, card, and then that would be the end of the campaign. It is resettable because you're gonna see, they say about 40 to 60%, uh, I believe that's what they said in the, in the, uh, at the end of a particular campaign. And uh, so you could reset it and play it again, and you'd have some different, obviously you'd have some different cards that come up as well. Uh, the one thing I did, Forget to mention is how does this flood uh, go uh, progress? And that's gonna happen whenever you need to draw a card from your ready pile, but you cannot. You would move this forward one. And again, as long as there's no card that is already there, let's say the barge was, had, had come back over here. As long as there's no unbuilt section of the canal, you're okay. But if this ever has to move onto a card, uh, then that would be one of the loss conditions. All right, 
That should give you an idea on how the Legacy of You is played. Let's head back over and I'll let you know what I think. All right, well, hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea on how Legacy of You is played. As I mentioned at the uh, intro here, there are a number of things that I did not include because they would be considered spoilers, and uh, just about everything in that storybook is going to be changing things in some way or another, potentially adding elements, potentially removing elements, but I don't want to get any more specific than that. It is just, a uh, again, in a campaign-style game, those types of things are going to occur, and I don't want to get into any specifics here. All right, well, about the game itself. Uh, first off, a couple of things. I'll just talk about the, uh, the, the components of the game and, and the art of the game. Uh, I absolutely uh, really like the art quite a bit, and the components are terrific. Uh, the the uh, cardboard is good quality, the cards are good quality, which is you know, something you can pretty much tend to expect from this publisher from Garfield Games. It is right in line with other games that they've done in, you know, the West Kingdom series, the North Sea, uh, or from kind of their ancient line like Hadrian's Wall uh, or Raiders of Scythia. It has, you know, a very similar look, and the components are all very, very good. One thing I did want to point out specifically is that this particular box has a really nice clear insert where at the box bottom, It'll kind of show you what goes in each area, and with the clear insert, you can just easily tell what goes where. Another thing I want to mention is that for a game like this, which is, again, a campaign-style game where you might be packing up, you're very unlikely to play through the entire campaign in one sitting. That would take <laughs> quite a while. Um, the ease of setting it up and putting it back down is very very, very high. This game sets up, it, it's a breeze to set it up, and even as you are kind of changing elements of the game throughout the uh, campaign, the way that is handled is very, very uh, seamless and, and very well done, and I never had any issues with, I never found it to be a chore to set up the game and to tear it down. It sets up very quickly. It actually does not take up a very large footprint, which is also very nice, especially in, again, a campaign-style game like this. That is something that is uh, kind of rare. And so I, I appreciate that here. So art is good, components are great, insert is great, set up and tear down is a breeze, which is something that I, you know, value quite a bit in a solo game. Now, for the actual game itself, this is a game that is very puzzly. Uh, essentially, it is going to be one where you are always feeling on the razor's edge, or at least I do. You know, now maybe there are there are certainly better gamers out there than me. That has been well established. Um, but I found the game to be quite a challenge. Uh, now, without giving uh, much of anything away, this is probably something that would be a bit intuitive to you. As you go into that defeat pile, there are going to be elements added that kind of balance the game a little bit more to, to maybe tilt the odds slightly in your favor. I don't want to get into, you know, again, more than that. But that kind of balancing system between the, the victory deck and the defeat deck, I think, is a really, really smart way to kind of keep the game balanced and keep that difficulty right where you want it, where if you win... Again, it, to me, it, it always feels like right on that razor's edge. It's coming down to that last turn. It gives a very nice feeling of, of you know, kind of excitement and progression and, and danger. I mean, you always, you know, again, uh, very rarely did I feel like I had things well in hand. Uh, very, you know, almost always I am just kind of scraping by, having to come up with some, you know, thinking, gosh, this is hopeless. I've got no chance. And then being able to puzzle some things out. And a lot of time that's going to be done through the trading element of the game, which is something that I think at the very first blush, the first couple of games, I don't think I realized how important it is to utilize all of the trades that as you build more sections of the canal, you're going to get kind of these cascading trades that happen where you are able to turn in a particular resource to get something else, which is going to allow you to get something else, which is going to allow you to get what you really need at that particular time. And so I don't think I understood the importance of that in my first few games. And as I went on, I realized what an important element of the game, being able to use resources 
to get other resources, to get other resources to get you what you need. Uh, and sometimes that'll be the cards, sometimes that'll be through the trades. Uh, another thing that I did not necessarily show in the overview is that one of the buildings, I believe they're called the outposts, but I'm not sure, the purple buildings, uh, as you build those, they allow you to also kind of, in a sense, trade workers so that now maybe white and red workers are treated as exactly the same in any in any case. So giving you that flexibility is also very important uh, as you go throughout the game and certainly as you go throughout the campaign. So I feel like the kind of core gameplay loop, the puzzly element of the game, the resource management, um, it almost has a bit of a deck building feel because as you're getting those um, townsfolk cards into your exhaust pile, they're of course going to be eventually shuffled into your ready pile. So there is a bit of a deck building element, but it's light. I don't feel like that's the core of the game. Really, your deck is another resource uh, to, to some extent. And, and oftentimes, I'm getting townsfolk cards mostly because I'm afraid of running out of them because you're going to have to lose them to the to the barbarians so often and through other elements, sometimes through building the canal, you have to lose cards as well. And so that deck is another resource that you have to manage and, and another thing you have to think about. So all of these things are just right up my alley as a solo gamer. A puzzly type of a game with a, a cool historical theme and element. I'm not even getting into the story deck as well, or the, yeah, the story deck, which is a deck of cards that are going to be things that are added, and the story book. I also really think that that is well done. They, the, the writing is good, but it's not overwhelming. These are just kind of, you know, usually smaller chunks of text that you're reading. Sometimes they're a, bit, a little bit longer and more involved. But the things that that adds are, are really interesting, and I, find my, I found myself uh, alternately horrified and, and thrilled over what I was reading in that storybook. You know, sometimes there are things you don't want to have happen happen, and other times there are things that, that can make you feel like, oh gosh, this is so great, I can now do this, this, or this. And so the, the story element is also really well done in the game. The one thing that could potentially be a, a, a negative, uh, I don't find it to be a huge issue, would be the, the fact that once you've played through the campaign, there are certain people that maybe feel like they're done with the game at that point. I certainly don't feel that way. Uh, it is resettable, and you could play through uh, multiple campaigns, and I think you would still have some elements that would be new. Obviously, a lot of the things that you saw in your first campaign, you will see in uh, continuing, you know, uh, follow-up campaigns. But there will be some things, you know, that, that would be different potentially from one campaign to the next. But I do want to mention that, that there are some people that might feel like they've seen just about everything there is to see after one campaign. Now, that being said, you are playing through a fair number of games. It's a variable number, as I mentioned in the overview, but you're going to be playing through a large number of games uh, pretty much no matter what. I think it's very unlikely you are going to win or lose every game, which would make it the, the shortest campaign in that sense. So uh, I, I feel like you're getting plenty of game regardless, If you even if you only played through one campaign, but... I think most people would, would, would uh, potentially, if they, if they made it all the way through one campaign and enjoyed it, I can't imagine that they're going to be completely uh, turned off by the, other, uh, the idea of playing through it again. So, uh, all of this being said, I think Legacy of You is an outstanding solo game. One, one of the better solo games I've played in the last few years. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10, a seal of excellence, a strong seal of excellence. This is a game that I think is going to be in the running for uh, my games of the uh, of the year. Um, as any game I rate a 9, I think is going to be something that I would be considering. Certainly going to be in the running for my top solo games of the year, if not top games of the year uh, overall. Uh, just a spectacular achievement uh, all the way across the board, from art to components to gameplay, story. I think it's all fantastic. All right, well... That's it for me. This is Mike Delicio signing off from Dice Tower Midwest Annex.